So good morning, everyone. Thanks very much for, for coming to our third of uh, the uh, Distinguished Speaker Lecture Series. And it's, uh, it's an indescribable pleasure for me to be able to introduce uh, Norm Bauer. And uh, you'll see why as I get through this. So he's currently the uh, Radcliffe Professor of Computer and Information Science at the University of Pennsylvania, where he has been on the faculty since 1974. Now, 1974 is a very auspicious day for me, I don't know about you, but for me it is, because, not day, year, uh, because uh, that was my entry into the graduate program in computer science. And I have to say that the very first of the intellectual influences in my graduate, pro graduate life was normal, because we had the same PhD supervisor, and my supervisor, uh, who was super terrific, uh, said, you know what, I have this student who's just finishing now, maybe you could see about continuing his work. So that was the norm, that was the norm. And we overlapped for, I think, just a couple of months or something uh, at Toronto. But that's really what started me off on my research, and it's a research thread that exists even today in terms of how one looks at um, the temporal issue when examining Images. So, I'll just formally thank you for being that first inspiration. And it kind of worked out for me, so I guess I'm happy. <laughs> it was a good thing. Um, he's one of the leaders and pioneers in the whole area of graphics and, and animation. And uh, that is enough uh, to, uh, to uh, tell you how uh, highly I uh, regard his work. Um, he says in his bio that he's been active in computer graphics since 1968. I guess that's when he started grad school, roughly, or earlier? Undergrad. Undergraduate. So he's been involved in computer graphics since before there was computer graphics. It is in, in, all, uh, in, in all reality. Um, as I mentioned, his PhD is from the University of Toronto, uh, but before that, he has a bachelor's degree um, in creative studies and mathematics from the University of California, Santa Barbara, what program that was in, and uh, mathematics in 1971. Uh, he has played uh, a leadership role in the computer graphics community uh, ever since, and um, focuses, uh, one of the major achievements is uh, the first of the human modeling uh, software packages named Jack. I don't know if he's going to cover any of that, but maybe some of you have heard it. Um, and it's used worldwide for human factors and ergonomics analysis of workplace and vehicle environments. He's a director of the program in digital media design, co-director of the master's program in computer graphics and game technology. He was associate dean, but we can leave that aside. Uh, and today, he's going to tell us about simulated people and their behaviors in urban contexts. Thanks very much. Thank you, John. I, I could talk an hour about John and the context, but thank you for picking up the work I didn't implement. <laughs> You've obviously made a good career at that, too. Thank you all uh, for inviting me here. It's a pleasure to be back in Toronto. I spent four very wonderful years here. And uh, who knows, it may end up being back now. <laughs> all right. Anyway, um, there is a subtitle here to, uh, to my talk, which uh, it's really a little easier to, to, to talk about is I really want to control people, uh, virtual people. And uh, that quest has uh, led to a, a whole bunch of interesting questions. I'll try to make them interesting to you as well. But I always like to operate under some very large, almost impossible dream so that I can always kind of fall back and, and when I'm asking myself what to do next, I can return to that question gauge how far away I, I, or how near the answering it I've come. I think I'm still far away. But that big question is, how can we, in computer graphics, simulate a population that really looks like a population anywhere in the world that is heterogeneous? We're all different. We're all doing different. Right now, I know you're all sitting there. But if you walk out of here, just even in the hall, people are doing all sorts of different things. So there's heterogeneity in behavior. And more often, more often than not, people are doing things purposefully. 
So they're not just wandering around. Even tourists don't just wander around. They go and visit things. So these are two vague terms, but they motivate when we look for things that differentiate and uh, make things appear to be uh, purposeful. Now, uh, I don't want to press on this too long, but I, I think it's worthwhile since John brought it up. Uh, and we didn't collude on this, that, that um, the experiences I got at Toronto uh, turned out to be extraordinarily uh, influential in almost everything else I've done. And I want to say that because as younger people, some of your students and younger people, you won't maybe realize that until you're several years out. And it's people who are teaching you today are actually really influencing you in very, very deep ways. So my influences at Toronto were John Bionopoulos, who we shared a supervisor with, who at that time was really an AI person, so I actually felt I was an AI student for quite a while. Um, Ron Becker, who was just hired while I was there as a computer graphics person, and, uh, and, and actually human computer interaction was his thing at that time, and Les Mezzi, who was the computer graphics person. So I was very fortunate to essentially be mentored by all three of these people, <coughs> and uh, as uh, John has already alluded to, the very first thing I was doing was trying to use computer vision uh, uh, to uh, uh, understand uh, what was going on in the scene and output it in natural language. So I wanted this big vision, literally, to go from what a computer could see <coughs> to a description in English of what it saw. Way too big a problem, but fascinating, and it led me to become what I would call myself today is a modeler. I, I really want to know models of things so I can transform one thing to another. Along the way, I did a whole bunch of other interesting stuff. Um, the, uh, the Jack software you can find online that belongs to Siemens. Jack is 20 years old now. He left the pen 20 years ago. Um, so I'm not going to talk about it. You're welcome to look it up. Uh, but we've done an awful lot of uh, things since we uh, started working uh, with human models. And uh, most of these, but not um, every, well, most of these boxes represent PhD students or more, but not every PhD student is represented in the box. But the point is, where we are today, it's sort of the end of this, is more or less what I want to talk about uh, in, this, in this talk. And, and actually, uh, about two thirds of what I'm going to be telling you today is, is actually not yet published. So you can take it as it's not yet vetted, but actually I think it's just simply not yet published. Um, and we'll leave it at that. <laughs> You can be the judge. So what is it we would really like to do? Well, let's set up a, 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 an impossible model and say, well, it, our holy grail it, in some sense would be to automatically create characters which serve just like the, the uh, actor population in the Truman Show. Uh, if you haven't seen the Truman Show, uh, it's worth seeing. Uh, but uh, I won't recap it for you other than to say that basically this guy grows up surrogate universe, and everyone in there is planted there in order to uh, make him have a life, but in fact, those aren't their real lives, they're actors. So it would be nice if somehow we could, let's leave aside the main character, which is a different control problem, and create a populace which looks like it's doing something purposeful and meaningful in a given environment. Well, that's kind of way too hard, but we can do, can we turn the lights down a little bit? So, uh, you know, with graphics, you actually want the paints off. You don't need to see. Uh, so this isn't exactly a, a great populace, but a bunch of stuff is going on, and it's a, it's a, a little bit of uh, robotics in there, which I, I loathe to do, but I had to for this. Uh, so this is real time. Uh, the, um, the, the, uh, there's an Android uh, phone that, that an operator, a uh, grad student, is actually using to do the robot. Uh, and, uh, actually, sorry, maneuver the soldier, and the robot is a surgical wingman, the robot follows along. That part is actually not very interesting. What is interesting here is that the environment is this marketplace, and people in this marketplace are uh, negotiating to buy things, um, they're having conversations, and they're reacting to the presence of the soldier and the robot. Some of them get angry, some of them get scared, and move away, some of them couldn't care less. But it's that kind of environment that kind of that happens uh, and at least you know, appears plausible, I'm not going to say I fooled anyone into thinking this is real, um, 
that is the direction we want to go. Okay, so what I'd like to do, um, and uh, hopefully um, I'll hang in here long enough so I can do most of it, is um, I want to talk about uh, a little bit about how we go about making uh, these functional groups of virtual people. Slightly historical view, recent historical view. Um, and along the way, I'll, I'll show you the representations that we uh, developed for that. And then I'll, I'll specialize a little bit more in, in some of this unpublished work. When we're going to, we've been looking at the influence of personality on the individual notion. We actually look at the influence of personality on crowds, but we're not going to talk about that today. And then finally, our, our latest work, which is literally in review this weekend, <clears throat> uh, on further humanizing agents to have environmental in, in, in reactions to their environment, especially with temperature. All right, so you'll forgive me for not recapping everybody's crowd simulation in the whole field. I'll point you to two recent books. Uh, Virtual Crowds just came out last year, late last year, and that's uh, uh, Vibhasha Kapadia, uh, the uh, fine import from Metro's Lutzos. Um, was a, a leader of that book. Uh, and since I brought up Basher's name, he has a cameo later on in one of the videos. Uh, I want to tell you about Basher. Um, I had money uh, from the uh, army to work on this human robot team that I wanted to show you. And I had enough money to get a postdoc. So uh, I hired Basher Kapadia uh, under the false belief that uh, if I had a postdoc, he could do all the work and I could do other things. Well, if you know Mubasher, it won't be surprising that when he arrived at Penn, I suddenly found myself twice as busy because he was such a dynamo. So in the two years Mubasher spent at Penn, I think we cranked out 15 papers. I have never been as busy in my life. Now that Mubasher's moved to lectures, it's like life is easy again. <laughs> but I really am uh, great. It was a wonderful gift <laughs> you sent us. Anyway, so we've been working uh, all uh, now about 15 years in what's loosely called crowd simulation. 15 years ago, we weren't smart enough to call it crowd simulation. But we started working with groups of pedestrians, and we went through a whole bunch of stuff. Most of this is now easy to find in uh, one or two of the books we've written. And the, oh, the other book is actually coming out by this summer. It's a Eurographics book that just went to the publisher. So if this virtual crowd stuff is interesting to you, there's now some, um, some good material that collects it together. Well, I want to start <coughs> about 10 years ago, uh, very briefly. One of the other uh, students and staff member for quite a while that I had was Jan Albeck. She's now tenured at George Washington University. Uh, she was also one of these people who made me do a lot more work than I thought I even wanted to. But that was good. Um, so she built a system called Carosa for animating human characters. I'm not going to show you her video. It, 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 it does what it's advertised to, but I don't have the time to show it. But um, what's important here is the perspective that she took on human animation was, uh, for a long time, very important to us. We had built a what we call PAR, a parameterized action representation. Uh, that's well described in the literature. What was exciting there was it was constructed uh, completely in concert with natural language people. So it was a representation that supported not only motion at the low level, but also the parsing and other things that uh, are needed to understand language. That, that's another topic, but it was, it was a very uh, fruitful approach. But when we use it to, used it to control the human agents, basically each agent had to do the process of what it, it, it was going to do. So every agent had a calendar. Well, it's, this is not a bad approach. It's like we all have our you know, Outlook or, or Google little calendars. And it's good. Those things told agents, you know, they had to get class, they had to go home, whatever. So that, that was good. <laughs> but they also had other things that there were rules that they could apply. Very much like the Sims, but not exactly. Um, they could react to situations. They could, um, um, they could have needs that were satisfied opportunistically or they could have a collection of things that they could do at random and they would choose between them. So, all right, anyway, it worked, but it was very agent-centric. Agents had things they had to do, okay? Now, that's kind of the natural AI approach to things. If you go and look at the uh, agent literature and, and, and the technologies that have been developed for AI agents, 
That makes complete sense. We have brains, we think, we act, we all like to think we have free will. Our epiphany happened shortly, uh, well, near the end of uh, Jan's time at Penn. We actually took uh, an alternative view of the world in uh, built events as the first class objects. So the, the first class object event we call smart events. And the idea is this made an event in control of the people. Now what we gave up is the brain, right, basically. So it's like, I guess the best analogy here is that someone decided that there should be a lecture event today. And I just happened to be here. So I was co-opted into <coughs> giving a talk to you, okay, as if I had nothing to do with it. Now it sounds bizarre. But if you were watching this from the outside and you didn't know whether I was thinking or not, it would actually look the same. I'm here doing what I do, whether I was told to do it, you know, and I'm just parroting something, or I actually went through some conscious thought process. You actually can't, you're supposed to be, you can't tell from the outside. But for graphics, this really worked really well. So these smart events basically are, I, you know, I want something to happen, something has to happen. And agents are recruited to play roles in that event. I'm going to leave as unbound variables like how we actually do that and which agents get done to do what and all that. It's interesting problems to explore a lot. But I don't want to get too deep. But it leads to a model of behavior which um, I somewhat facetiously call you know, an event across some uh, predisposition or priming term we adopted psychology literature leads to behavior, right? So I, I think of it this way. I, I have many roles I can be primed for. Right now, I'm being primed for the giving a talk role, right? But you know, if I go home and there's garden work to be done, I, I have a garden role. And in, in that role, I'm unlikely to give a speech, okay? Just like I'm probably not going to start pulling weeds. Okay, so, so events happen in context and, and the kinds of things that are primed for then produce certain uh, kinds of behavior. And this, this worked out to be uh, quite interesting. And what we found here is some, in some experiments we did is that uh, when events were in control, that there were um, emergent stories that people imposed upon these events to explain why they were likely to happen. Uh, my favorite, which I, I'm not going to show you, is the graphics is actually pretty crying. But we built smart events for fires. So basically, the event was a fire. <laughs> and when there was a fire, the fire actually wanted to be put out. So it co-opted people into, into knowing that there was a fire. Depending on their goals, they would do things like run away, or watch it, or maybe even get a fire extinguisher. Well, in one of the simulations that we did, one of the people was primed to be fearful and, and ran away, and another was a fireman or, or somebody, I can't remember, who was primed to go to the fire to try to put it out. And at that time, we had a really crummy crowd simulator. So these two people, one running away from the fire, one running to it, actually ended up in the same place. Well, what had happened is there was collision detection. They didn't pass through each other. But they got to this point, and they, they, they kind of jogged around a little bit, and then they went their separate ways. And we looked at this as, oh, yes, the person running away from the fire is telling the other person where it is and what to do, right? So I made up a story that explained what I saw, but in fact, nothing like that was really happening. So we, we figured that these events could actually trigger some emergent behaviors, which were quite interesting. And it got us interested in this particular uh, problem of how two agents might interact. Now, again, keep, uh, maybe keep in mind that the overall context here is I want to deal with large groups of people. But in order to deal with large groups, we can make them very homogeneous. You know, the fire alarm rings, we all leave the building. That kind of homogeneous thing. But I'm interested in the atomic things that really made for that purposeful and heterogeneous behavior. So when we saw this accidental conversation happen, we say, well, what kind of conversations do people have? And in crowd simulation, do they ever have conversations? Well, the answer is no, almost not. I mean, some of the games you might it's happening here. We didn't see these arise as part of the, the research work. So we started looking into conversations, and um, we, um, we created a few archetype 
archetypes of conversations. There, there are many more, but four were good enough for us. Question answering. So if you ask a question, get an answer. Uh, friendly chatting, you know, two people talking. Uh, bargaining, uh, you have some kind of purpose, you need some negotiation, there's something you can, or arguing, which could lead to something else, right? So clearly, um, one approach to animating a group of people would be to just choose a conversational type arbitrarily, um, but that seemed to be a little, you know, just random didn't seem to be good. So what instead is we looked into this, and we came up with a list of, there are probably more than this, so we came up with 14 conversation types. The first um, 11 are dyadic, uh, two people. We didn't want to worry about multiple people, we'll just do parallels. So how can two people have a conversation? It turns out there's a lot of different ways. Okay, you standing facing each other, you could be walking, someone could be walking and saying something to someone sitting. And, and nowadays we have people who are having conversations seemingly with themselves because they're in cell phones. So we looked at, uh, at those, so you won't remember the numbers, but we then made up, okay, invented, okay, we just guessed at the percentage of time people would have these conversations in different environments. And the, the point here is not the numbers so much, as the point here is the environments can do different, uh, different distributions. And just to single out a few, for example, uh, on the street, people are generally having face-to-face -face conversations. Number two is you know, just off to the side, but face-to-face. -face. Um, uh, but often they're having conversations while they're walking, side by side, or in passing. Uh, in a restaurant, however, most conversations occur when you're seated. You across the table from someone you're, you're, you're right? um, In a marketplace, most of the time it's like face-to-face because -face you're doing a transaction. Okay? And then over here on the cell phones, people walking around just talking to themselves, usually on cell phone. In Philadelphia sometimes there's no cell phone. <laughs> so we just guessed at those numbers. Uh, and then uh, we also guessed at what kinds of uh, uh, conversations might be happening. And again, these are different by, by, uh, by environment. So on the street, people might be asking directions or just stopping and talking. Um, you know, in a restaurant, most of the time, there is talking. Um, shopping mall, you know, you're probably doing more negotiation and so forth. Well, so again, these numbers are totally by guessing. What's important to us was not the numbers so much, but the fact that they were differentiated. So if we were going to have people who seemed purposeful, it would be appropriate that they did things that were likely or less likely, you know, more, more likely in the environment. So now we found ourselves in the position of making a lot of educated or uneducated guesses and having no real data. So a couple of years ago, I had summer students uh, led by a very smart undergraduate, Alyssa Wolf, and we actually did an ethnographic study that was just published last summer in Presence. Um, we, uh, we took two very different locales in Philadelphia. One, we had a very large um, uh, indoor uh, market right downtown. Really it's about uh, 300 feet, like 100 meter by 100 meter space. Um, and we have a, a major downtown plaza. There, there are several, but the, 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 the fancy one or the main one is right in the middle of this house Square. So they're very different. One's a place where you shop, one's a place where you just go and hang out. Okay? And the students who were doing the study were basically taking a lot of visual data, very unobtrusively. Things like uh, age, gender, or are they, in, you know, are they in groups? Are they singly? But what we we're most interested in, you know, what they were doing, we haven't even used that data yet. But what we were first we we're looking at is what were people carrying? Okay, I, I challenge almost any of you to go online and look at crowd simulations and computer graphics, and you'll find people walking around very dutifully, you know, with their arms swinging, and they'll be oblivious. The only exception, by the way. To that is some work that came out of the annual Talmud screen on a reconstruction of Rome, which was actually very nice. The, the ancient Romans actually were carrying some things, but the, they, they didn't know what people carried, but they looked like they belonged there a little bit more. So, um, what we found was really actually surprising to us, which is why research is fun, is that we found that over three quarters of the people in both of these environments were pretty different, they all they were carrying something. No, they were carrying the ball, you know, they're all. Two dozen different things that you carry: backpacks, kids, you know, 
cell phones, whatever. I mean, we have all that, all that's now published. But the fact that people are carrying things was the important takeaway. And the implication there for any of you or any of us for a crowd simulation is, is, is the, really the negative of that. If you don't have people carrying things, it's not going to work. I don't care how realistic your characters look. If they don't look like they have objects, almost all of them have objects associated with them, they're not going to look like them. Now you can see our, our animations and you can say, ah, you didn't do it. That's yes, correct. Right. We're still working on that. A lot of stuff we haven't gotten to use it. All right, so coming off of the work that Jan had done with Carosa and the agent-centric stuff and this new work on the event-centric stuff, we needed a new software tool set to, uh, to build that uh, representation out. And so I um, managed to uh, have, uh, almost by a quirk of fate, <coughs> uh, take on a PhD student named Alex Schulson. And the reason a quirk of fate is he didn't actually apply to work with me. He wanted to work with a <coughs> professor in machine learning, but that other professor didn't have money. So I said, okay, Alex, I'll take two. And he said, yes, it's really good for everybody. And he worked a lot with Mubashir uh, Kapadi. So, <coughs> uh, so Schulson uh, decided that he was going to build a software layer on top of Unity 3D, so we'll get good graphics finally. Uh, and he wanted to use as his uh, representational primitive uh, behavior tree. In fact, he added parameterization to the behavior trees. So the interesting part of the behavior trees is that it's basically the full power of the programming language with some constraints. They're and or trees. Um, so you, you, you're not writing completely arbitrary programs. You are writing programs with certain structure. So you can have um, a sequence of things that you must do, uh, or you know, that's a, a sequence. Or you have a, essentially a case statement. You have a priority selector. You can do any one of the three things that, um, for example, that fall under the selector. Or you can even attach uh, probabilities to those. So then you could say, well, you know, I want 30% uh, of the time to choose uh, path one, 30%, you know, 40% of the time to choose path two. And there's some randomization on there. That's kind of like. Uh, all that's uh, aleatoric, but at least it was structured in a particular way. And of course, you have the subtrees. You have you can you can build out arbitrary trees of, of behaviors. So this worked pretty well um, for doing uh, animations. So this is actually a conversation parameterized behavior tree. I'm going to let it run a couple times because it actually goes pretty fast. So basically, you instantiate the event. It says, I want to have a conversation. So I need to bind it to two agents and some meeting position. It turns out that I uh, only have two agents here. So they're the ones that are bound. And they are uh, attracted to the meeting point. So they see the sequence. Uh, both A1 and A2 have to go to the meeting point. Meeting point is uh, parameters that gets propagated down. And once they are together, then I have a loop element which just cycles through random gestures for each two for a period of time and eventually they stop. Right? So it's a structure that was relatively easy to script behaviors. Uh, and then there was an engine underneath it which actually did the animation. So uh, the ADAPT model uh, had three major software components, behavior, navigation, and animation. <coughs> Behavior were, the behaviors are uh, built out of these parameterized behavior trees, these handwork trees. So those can be put in a, a, a database or a library of, of uh, action events that can be utilized. And I'll show you how to use these in a bit. Um, in a sense, the least interesting part of this is the navigation and steering part. So once you say, you know, you've got to go from A to B or you've got to get to B, the agent has to get there and not run into things. So that we can just use what's in Unity, or we can plug in some other steering algorithm. Um, we have a local expert on that, Professor Petras, who leads us. <coughs> but also, Adapt had an animation controller so that we could get interesting behaviors out of these agents at the low level without stuffing them up at inappropriate high levels. <coughs> so the way that Schulson did this was 
to build an animation controller that blended together the motion of what he called choreographers. So there were a number of different choreographers that could be uh, used to uh, create motions in a character, and then these were literally overlaid and blended to create final motion. So, of course, you can do that for multiple characters. So let me show you what the choreographers do. So the, the brown guy is the final uh, mannequin that's animated, but there are shadows that execute different components or different uh, parts of the motion. For example, uh, one of them, the red one here, is actually reaching points in space. Um, the green is executing this sort of flicking gesture. And uh, there's a, a gaze uh, choreographer which is making him look at the uh, red point in space. And <coughs> these are now all blended together so that the final animation is able to be responsive to all these independently determined needs. So there are some other ones. That, there's also a physics ragdoll controller. So throw balls at him. Okay, that's, and <coughs> there's even a, a, a real-time Kinect-based controller that can be overlaid on, on the other choreographers. And there's a cameo of a flash of and this was even a two-person uh, interaction. So they're having this mock fight where no creature is actually being hurt. All right, so then uh, since we have all these events and we have a, a, an animation system to execute them, it becomes very easy to instantiate events, co-opt agents who are nearby into those events, and then have them execute a, a little story. So uh, these are all driven by these parameters and behavior trees. The crowd sim here is, I think, what's built into uh, Unity. And I'll go at the end of this thing here, but eventually they go all, all go in there and they have seats. And the sitting is one of those, like gesture animation is going into it. All right, so now we have a, a software layer that uh, let us pretty flexibly control an individual agent, had an architecture which, based on events which let us control groups of agents. So we thought, all right, this is a pretty good basis from which to uh, build a next set of, uh, of uh, research projects. So uh, uh, Mubasher and, uh, and Alex uh, actually embarked on uh, uh, work partly in conjunction with ETH Zurich and Disney Research to uh, build a narrative story engine called Canvas. And I'll show you a couple of clips from Canvas. It's not all Ken's work, so I, I don't have all the full stuff on that because it belongs to Disney. But I can show you how they used it now. Um, but we also did some other uh, uh, stuff with it, and I'll get to that. Um, all right, so some of this, uh, I think this is uh, mostly documented in the last chapter of the book that just came out in the fall. So I'm, I'm keeping everything pretty you know, high level here for a while because uh, I'd rather show you the bigger picture, the details. I'm not too much detail. So we have PhD students. All right. But the, uh, the, the work on Canvas uh, was uh, Schulzen's PhD uh, thesis. So this was just finished up about a year and a half ago. So what he wanted to do was actually build stories. Okay? He was a gamer through and through. He wanted to readily construct stories. He didn't want to do all the work of scripting out all the gazillion different um, ways that a story could progress, especially in a more or less open world. So some of the key characteristics here, of course, we built it on top of Adapt and, and Unity, so we got the graphics working. It was event-centric. Okay? The key things were you didn't build individual agents so much as you built events. And when you build events, Alex found that you can storyboard the events. You want this to happen, and then you want this to happen, and you want this to happen. And you may not particularly care who does what as long as those things happen. There are issues of consistency and whatever. So underneath all that, or on top of all that, there was an actual planner, okay, state-based planner that was built to uh, <coughs> to automate uh, some of the transitions between the story worlds. So I'm going to let this should have narration, which was working. Yes. Well, it's not all there. Oh, this 
supposed to extend. We had some. All right. Well, what's going on? All right. So over in the right corner are some of the storyboards. Means there we go. A subplot plays out in which the robbers go across each other until only one is remaining. A narrative with this length and complexity takes minutes to offer. These are the reads of the The contrast, current operating systems require immense effort in scripting of details that are irrelevant to the progression of the narrative. Okay, so maybe it's easier for me to talk over this. All right. So what's happening here are a sequence of events are determined by the director. And those events are used as the basis for a planner to try to make sure that individuals are co-opted in consistent roles across the events. Um, and uh, the story then plays out by replaying story animations, perhaps mostly. So the, uh, the idea here was the very uh, rapid design of the storyboard, but also the rapid ability to change it. So if you don't like the story that came up um, from this run, you could just change the storyboard um, and uh, you would get the same uh, scene with uh, similar actors play out with a different result. <clears throat> so in this case, the first, the first one, so you couldn't hear it, I apologize for that. Uh, with what, uh, there are three robbers and one of them uh, double crosses the other two and basically knocks them out, so he gets all the money. In this one, um, the, the, the robber ends up uh, you know, co-opting the, uh, the bank manager to opening the vault, but uh, one of the civilians uh, has discovered that the guard dropped his gun, and so the civilian picks up the gun and confronts the robber, makes a citizen's arrest, right? So it's a whole different story with the same basic events, but it played out because of the, uh, the, the, the director's storyboard choices. So uh, it's, it's really sketchy, but it, Alex got it to work, and it's my understanding that this is uh, being continued at Disney Research as one of their uh, game uh, generation tools. All right. Uh, all right, so the more we work with groups of people, the more we realized that they were sensorily impoverished. Uh, there, we had done, in fact, we had a nice discussion before here with uh, John Sosos and, and Petras about uh, things like attention and vision, you know, robotics and vision is big here, and that's super. Um, our graphic agents, many of them, have very primitive vision capabilities. I mean, when I say R, I mean the field as a whole. <clears throat> but if you look at what other senses they have, they have very few. The graphic agents, uh, for most part, are really pretty dumb and blind. You make them walk somewhere and they walk there. And if you're lucky, they don't run into things. They have to write code so they don't collide. So we started thinking about, well, what, what can we do to make our agents a little more human-like? And uh, we came up uh, with the idea of adding uh, auditory perception. Can they perceive the sound of the environment? Now, not speech, although we dabbled in it. We're not particularly interested in speech. We're just interested in sound. You, know, you go across the street, the car hums the horn, beep, beep, you stop. Okay. You didn't see the car, maybe, but you heard it. So those environmental sounds uh, propagate in an environment that's a relatively well uh, I guess for the most part, well modeled problem how to sound propagate. But we were particularly interested in how a virtual agent would perceive sound, and that's actually much harder. Okay, we're in a nice, pretty quiet room here. There are probably all sorts of environmental sounds outdoors that we don't hear. And you say, oh, it's because the room is you know, soundproof, the doors are closed. But you know, that's not quite the whole story. I mean, there, there are things that we could hear, maybe if they were loud enough, or if they were shrill enough, or so forth. So it's not a totally insulated space. 
So we looked at this problem from two perspectives, uh, limiting ourselves for the most part to environmental sound sources. Um, we really want to know how agents could perceive the sound space around them. Because if they could perceive the sound space, they could then react. All right, so the environments we, uh, we used were a number of sound sources. We found a, a great resource that uh, we based this on, a psychological study and, of uh, perception of, of uh, environmental sounds and we built on a really strong base that someone else had produced, but that didn't have any implementations. So computationalized it, right? Um, um, so this, this work uh, included building tools. Uh, and you'll see some of them go by quickly in the, in the video. This is going to be remarkably detail-free uh, because I'm interested mostly in uh, that it works. Uh, but ultimately what uh, we, we want is that an agent has some possibly vague perception that there's an environmental sound. Not. And if they can perceive it, they can name it. And if they can't perceive it very well, they may only be able to get a category. Uh, I heard an impact sound. I don't know what caused the impact, but I heard the impact. Or they may have heard something, but they couldn't even identify it. So those sort of partial or, 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 or vague matches were okay for us. This isn't an all or nothing thing. I hear it, I don't. If I hear it, I know what it is. No, it's like, I heard something, but I don't believe it. That was completely fine. Let's hopefully the audio will work on this. Current virtual human simulations only consider visual perception while modeling the behavior. Can you hear that? I hear. In this video, we present an agent based sound propagation and perception framework. All right, so, so, since we can't hear it, I'm just going to talk about it. So, this is uh, there's a sound source, and uh, <clears throat> generally, um, Okay, it goes away. Okay. So the sound source is the, the red square, and he, he whistled, and uh, when he was behind all those other people, they absorbed a lot of the sound so that the guy in the green square couldn't hear it. He heard something, but he didn't hear the whistle, so he didn't respond. <clears throat> so the idea is that we take these environmental sound signals, we build a sound packet representation from that. Essentially, it's a coarse, discrete uh, Fourier transformation. We throw out information we don't need so that we are only propagating the packets that have information, say it's computation time. Uh, we try to get the parameters of that to be relatively close to what human perception can tell us. That all goes on offline. Now, online, we build a sound propagation tool that uh, works in a gridded space and to speed it up we uh, have a quad tree space and this just shows that they get basically the same results. So this is, this is real time. So if there's a sound source, <coughs> it can uh, suffer from diffraction, reflection, absorption, and uh, eventually that sound peters out. So the sound propagates the environment. It can be an environment with other obstacles. It can be an environment with other people. People are sound absorbers. Go to a concert when the hall is empty and when the hall is full, it sounds good. <clears throat> For the perception side, we use this work that was developed by a psychologist who built a hierarchic cluster of sound types. So there are harmonic and non-harmonic types. Um, at the, the bottom of the tree, the leaf nodes are specific sounds, and then they're intermediate categories. So without sound, it's, you don't have to trust me. But there's some uh, labeling. So there's a symbol that's slapping. As we move further away, the um, agent's perception is at the top. So here's some impulse, but then behind the, all these obstacles, uh, it hears something that it doesn't, can't identify. It. Um, over here, as we continue to rotate around, um, it, it's, it's really hard to hear because there's people in the way. It's, it's audible, but not identifiable. And then when we move the people away, um, we get back to uh, an impact sound. And then inside the building, we can't, we can't hear anything at all. So the perception is, is based upon the packets that are received uh, by the individual. And you can see it, it depends on the 
depends entirely on the environment that can be changing for the mind as well. So let's see how this can be used in practice. This is something a crowd simulation can't do correctly. Oh, sorry. Blind corner can't see the agent, but it's sound. Oh, you me. One can slow down. So you can do whatever uh, reaction changes. Demonstrate the benefit of spread. Okay, this one we're going to. I'll just tell you what to say about this game. This one we involves a player controlled avatar searching for and destroying. So this was a high school student modified a Unity game to add sound perception. So the robots have sound perception. If they hear sound, they attack you. If they don't, they don't know you're there. So it's an interesting variant on a game mechanic. Uh, I'm just going to show you a little bit of the next one. We then took this work and added localization so that when somebody was maneuvering around the environment, uh, they were using sound as a, as a targeting device. So all of the agents here are actually visually blind. The only thing they have are the sound perceptions. And the short story is they're actually looking at the local gradient of the sound packets in their vicinity. So they're cheating a little bit. They don't quite have ears. They have a little bit of a sensor. But they're able to actually navigate pretty well from that sound gradient. So the green cylinder is where the agent thinks the walking agent is. It's pretty accurate. So let me move toward you.
<clears throat> so uh, there are there are lots of there's lots of literature on various parts of this problem, and we don't think that that literature covers the generality we needed. So we go we go for the jugular. We we've been using the ocean personality model. This is what's called Big Five. It's the, the principal. Uh, that sort of maximal complexity personality uh, uh, profile that, that's used in literature. <laughs> and uh, we also wanted to go with arbitrary motion. So we, all, we didn't want to just say, well, we can deal with certain kinds of motion and make it look like the character of the personality. We really, really would like to have any motion mediated by any personality. Now, the way we wanted to do this, um, historically, as ancient roots in my own work, we've been looking at something called lava movement analysis for literally decades. And it, it turns out, we believe still, that it's a great intermediary representation for things that you want to do in motion because that's how it was developed. Now, LMA is a formal description of human movement, but it lacks one critical characteristic that we as computer science would want. It's not quantitative. It's a purely qualitative system. And as we all know, that doesn't cut it when you want to turn in homework assignment. Yeah, my program sort of does what you want. No, it's going to actually do it. <clears throat> so these qualities by themselves do not really describe computational techniques. What does body, effort, space, and shape mean? Well, <clears throat> the qualitative part is pretty well established. There are four uh, effort uh, factors space, weight, time, and flow. Those names are English. They come from the German, so they don't really quite mean that, but they're, they're short in words. But there are two sort of extremes in each of, each of these factors. <clears throat> now, the efforts for people who do motion analysis, the, they, they really don't occur in isolation very much. Most of the time when people move, they occur in groups of two or three. And the groups of three are called drives. So a movement that has for example, weight, space, and time dimensions, but no flow will be called an action drive. For us, those don't mean anything. The names don't mean anything. What's important is the drives are looking at combinations of three or four things, where the stuff has variation. All right. Shape quality is a little simpler. All right, now what is it we want to do? All right, so what we want to do is derive two methods. This is the computer part. One of the mappings will go from personality to these LMA parameters. Now, we've got a couple of hard things here. We've got to characterize personality, and we've got this quantitative system of LMA, qualitative. So that's, that, that doesn't have a numerical basis, so we have to quantify that. <clears throat> and then we also have to go from LMA to motion parameters, which again is from qualitative to a quantitative. So we have to do both arrows. So the way we did this, is first we had experts create the mapping from LMA um, for the drives. So the mapping's from LMA drives to motion. And I'll, I'll show you an example of that. After we had that mapping, we went to Mechanical Turk and had subjects give us the personality to LMA mappings. Although we didn't quite tell them it was LMA, we'll show you how. Um, and we didn't quite tell them it was personality until we did that too. Um, but by building these two mappings, we were able to link them. All right, so how does this work architecturally? All right, so we start in the middle with the LMA factors. There's eight factors. Think of them as eight variables. But we don't know what the numerical values of those variables would be. So we have to adopt two mappings. One is experts tell us with such and such a setting of these parameters, this affects the motion in a way that looks right. Okay, so that's a human thing going to establish the qualitative part into motion. Then we go to Mechanical Turk and ask people, you know, of some personality type, which one looks the most like um, these LMA drives? So we ask them comparative. And so we build a, a mapping there from a personality type to an LMA preset. Now we can take an arbitrary motion, do a little pre-processing, not much, like keyframes, and we can pass them through the LMA motion parameters to modify the output. 
And that can happen in real time. All right. So, um, yes, we use this, this model. It's not particularly uh, required that we use a mannequin. We'll show you some others soon enough. Um, shape things. Well, what happens is that the motion parameters tell us things like you know, turning ankles and moving feet and raising the body and various, various relatively straightforward global changes in body shape. We add in flourishes to make things look good. Um, this is just a panel from the expert study, uh, which you'll see a little bit more in the video. It's basically the expert sits there and diddles with the dials until the expert says, yeah, I think that looks like the drive. Go on to the next one. So that's manual labor with experts. <laughs> the Amazon Mechanical Turk study for personality to LMA uh, is a little more tedious. We had 244 unique participants. They were asked side-by-side -side questions. Which one looks more like this personality, this one or this one? So it's a little easier. Um, but we asked each one 60 different questions. Um, now, the problem with that is, and it's the interesting part of the experiment design here, is you can't put the ocean parameters and the elevate parameters and ask them to connect the two. So we have surrogates for them both. For, instead of the ocean personality parameters, and we use these tippy personality terms. And you can go online and take this test yourself to find out your ocean parameter. You answer 10 questions with um, this Likert scale. You cross the two, and bingo, you get your ocean type. It's actually quite relevant. Well um, there's a website if you want to find it. Right? So the user study is basically, what does it say? Which character looks more extroverted, enthusiastic, and less reserved and quiet? Basically asking you that tippy question without making you think you're taking a personality test. But you're answering it for that character. All right, so we go through all these things, and we actually get highly correlated results, which was a huge surprise, by the way, because we didn't expect that it actually works so nicely. But just to point out things, for example, if you have high openness in your personality, it seems to correlate well with indirect use of space and free flow. Now, it actually doesn't matter whether you understand what those terms mean, I don't explain them. I'm not going to go there and dance around. The point is, they're all different. That's the surprise. They actually do differentiate. You want someone who looks highly agreeable, then they probably should be as lightweight and sustainable. This is good news. Right? So now, assuming that all this is true, we've got to validate it. So we did another Amazon mechanical trick validation. So we actually now animated these guys with those with that chart, basically, and asked people which looks more like that personality. And again, these are the two terms as surrogates. This time we used 55 people, and we actually did something interesting there. We didn't just use that wooden mannequin, we used a male uh, figure, a female figure, and a mannequin, and we'll see what the result is. Um, so this is the female figure, so that looks pretty realistic. You know, again, this is what it says. Is which character looks more sympathetic and warm and less critical? Of course, just took those tippy things going. But you know, this one does, or this one doesn't. Right? So the validation basically says, you know, quick flashcards at you. Yes, most of the time the validation said people did agree with the assessment. You know, very, you know, down around less than five percent of the time they did receive it correctly. And actually, um, it, it works across actions, which is nice. It's not a huge set of actions, but it's relatively consistent across pointing, throwing, and walking. That's good, because you wouldn't want it really specific to one action. And this was actually even the most surprising, is it didn't depend on whether it was an male, female, or male. So there wasn't any bias there. There was a wooden mannequin, and you're getting results which were completely consistent with the real estate. So a little bit of this one. Um, again, in the interest of time, uh, just going to run through exactly what I said. You'll see little snippets of these uh, experiments. So this is the expert adjusting the motion parameters until she believes that motion conforms to the drive she's been asked to animate. A purely uh, qualitative process, iterated endlessly with uh, several people until there was uniform agreement that those motion parameters were correct. It would take as long as they wanted. This wasn't, this wasn't a test. 
So this is the direct sign of the strong side of pride, for example. All right, so then uh, the personality study, which is more extroverted, enthusiastic, which is less reserved and quiet. And you can pick the left, the right, or you can say they're the same. It wasn't forced to us. And there were some attention checking, so people didn't fall asleep. You know, which character is pointing? <laughs> uh -huh. These things can get really boring if you're doing 60 of these. Right. So, if you want to make disagreeable characters, you use uh, those uh, LMA characteristics. You want to make melodic characters, you use those. And you can blend. You don't have to use the extremes. You can come up with any amount you want. So now we can create characters with different personalities by just randomly assigning them the LMA values within the ranges appropriate to that personality type. And this was the validation, you know, which one looks, you know, I'll run it through that, you ask people if in fact it looks that way, and they say most of the time it does. Alright. Which one looks more sympathetic and more and less critical of the world's the guy that really looks pretty nasty. Yes. Okay. Um, so now we can do this for any act. So we took, this was a salsa dance right out of the CMU database. And uh, this is the way it was performed. And now we can modify that. Um, so the extroverted neurotic, uh, we just add more indirect, sudden, and free movements. Now I don't expect that you're going to say, ah, yes, I see it. If you study this, especially if you look at them side by side, you know, you start to notice that this guy looks a little more jerky, okay? um, and, uh, and, and he uses the extroversion, he uses much more space. So they're very subtle things. Okay, here's the introvert doing this also. Probably more the way I would do it. Uh, you know, it just looks a lot more tentative. I think we're doing one more with them side by side. But I think at this point you'll trust me. Okay. Got a few more minutes? Um, yeah. I promise. Okay. This is the this is one now that really we, we have yet to do. This isn't even unpublished. It's not completed. Okay. But it's very exciting. Because now I've got over here this mapping from oceans to ocean personality parameters from an arbitrary motion to an output function, arbitrary. Where do the personality parameters come from? Well, we've been doing those studies too, using mechanical Turk and some other stuff. And we have some fascinating information on the stereotypical personalities of 135 cultures and about 100 professions and two genders. So the idea here is if you want to build a game, you can essentially dial the country, the occupation, and the gender of your characters, get their personality, ocean parameters, blend them together any way you want, or change them if you want, and feed them into this. And just to show you that the data is actually fascinating, this is the openness dimension, 135 countries, and there's huge variation. I mean, some, some of these countries have very open characteristics, stereotypes, going out and surveying them or asking you know, people what they think. And some of them are very not. And just to give you some example, I'm going to give you the max of men we found so far. Maximum openness personality Australians. You can see if these meet your own stereotypical expectations. Don't forget there's like 135 there. So I'm just giving you the extreme. That least open, North Korea. And so it's not maybe a cultural thing, it could be a country, but stereotype. Conscientiousness, Japanese. Least, Asian. Extroverted, Brazilian. Possible. Least extroverted. Yeah. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> you are the most agreeable. Thank you for staying for my talk. <laughs> uh, least agreeable, North Korean. Most neurotic. Don't know why. Um, these neurotic Swiss, that's also seems to be good. 
So there's fascinating data there you're going to get. Multiple Excel charts with all this. All right, we're almost out of time. I'm going to just give this a super quick one and another video. After doing the sound stuff, we realized that the sound influenced behavior. That was great. But there's something else that influences behavior that's not vision, it's not sound, and that's the whole environment. This room's nice and comfortable, okay? If we were all sitting outside, it's not that cold today, but if we were all sitting outside, we'd probably want to wear our coats. Probably be a little less comfortable. Probably want to go inside. So thermal environment affects what agents do, what people do. So, big diagram basically says that. People's behavior depends on two factors that have not been well studied in crowd literature. One is, one has been somewhat studied, which is the density. If we were all packed together, we would be a little uncomfortable. But the part of it that hasn't been studied is the thermal environment that we're in. And what's interesting is those can interact. That, that's sort of a lot of line of this. But if we're all packed together, we're actually heat sources. Each, each one of us is about a 400 watt lamp. So if we're packed together, we're going to generate heat. If there are a lot of people in the room, the air conditioning has to work harder. So these are real effects. Um, there's a framework, yes. Right? There is a comfort model, which this could be a quiz after this. The comfort model for humans is actually part of an ISO standard. So it takes into account all sorts of things like the kind of clothing you like that you're wearing, the air temperature, obviously, the humidity, the wind speed, all sorts of other good stuff. But it's the sort of thing that you can use in a physical simulation of the temperature environment. Uh, just one of the factors that we use is clothing. So you can have a short sleeve uh, coat or, uh, or just the clothes. Now, this, uh, uh, these ISO models actually build a human comfort model. Uh, on a scale from minus three to three in temperature, they will produce what's called a predicted percent dissatisfied. This is a probabilistic measure because you can't guarantee that everyone's going to be unhappy if it's hot. Some people will love it. Likewise, it's cold. Otherwise, we need people to ski. Okay? So just because you're near the end of that spectrum doesn't mean you're always unhappy. So this is a probabilistic measure. It varies between five percent and one hundred percent. So all the decisions we make are probabilistic. There's also a density model, which is again probabilistic. Okay, and, you can, and we blend the two. That's just simple. What's, what's novel about what we do is that the thermal comfort is not an instantaneous process. The temperature in this room goes up to 40 degrees Celsius. We don't all instantly run out of here. It's getting warm in here. Maybe after five minutes of that, we're gonna say, oh, it's really uncomfortable. So there's an integration time window over which the thermal information is processed by individuals that's not true of the visual and the, and the, and the sound, at least not true of the same way. So for example, here's the temperature rising. That's the orange line. And as the temperature rises up towards 31 uh, degrees Celsius, uh, this agent is very likely to shed his coat and then eventually shed his uh, outer garment and then just be sure so one response to changing temperatures, change your clothing, you can do that. The other thing you can do is move. Okay, if you're, if you're in an environment where it's very warm, maybe because a lot of people are standing around you, if you're too warm, you can move away from them. Or if you're too cold, you can move into an area that's higher density and get the warmth from your neighbors. So all this says is what people do depends on the temperature and, and the people themselves affect the temperature. This, I promise, is the last video, and it's got music, so we will we'll let the music play in the
did most of these in the uh, red internal market that we had. So red spheres are heat sources, blue are heat sinks.
it by itself is just a contributor to this blend. And that it's actually a pipeline, so you don't throw everything together at once. But choreographers kind of a misnomer. They're not doing uh, anything unique, they're just handling the physics or the handling of the motion. But there's a there's a there is a pipeline to the blend. Absolutely, yes. The hard part for us was establishing that there was even a viable connection at all. Yeah. And I, I actually draw the efforts and personality you know, essentially as dials, because I view it exactly that way. It, even the term stereotype, it's here's a preset. It may be totally wrong than what you want, but you don't have to think about it. Okay? If, you, if you're building a game in Canada, and you want to export it to, let's say, Indonesia, you know, I have no idea what to do. I oh, lost my, lost my fire. Um, I may not have any idea what to do. But I go into my data and say, well, the stereotypical Indonesian has these characters. I just plug in those new personality, and it might not look quite right, but then I can tweak it. Um, in, the, in the ancient literature, people talk about personality, um, mood and emotion. There's three different levels. And that is true too. I can be in the mood and be you know, not, not too happy, maybe I'm in a good mood some of the people I like. But the, the, the baselines for those three things are different. So we, we've also, again, talked about having and implemented that on a baseline personality, you can modulate that with, say, emotional or mood variables, and you'll always return to that baseline. So absolutely, totally right. In fact, my last slide was going to be, and I hope a lot of other people do work in this area because it's just, it's open for us, it's open almost too many doors. So we'll have time for, yeah. the, for the graduate students to ask questions during lunches in Lausanne 30, 33, whoever's coming. And just as a final comment and to, the, to the students again, uh, it's not just this amazing body of work that we have seen Norm present. I hope you've also noticed the passion and excitement that he shows for his work. It's something I remember from the early days when I met him, and it's still there all those years. And it's so important for you to develop that ability in, when you're presenting your own work. So this is a great example uh, for you to follow. Thank you, Norm, for such a great presentation. Thank you.